Um, I'm Harvey Gallery. I represent the CMX team. Uh, today we're going to go into an API deep dive a little bit. Um, so what I want to do first is the agenda basically is I'll give you an introduction of the architecture. Um, then we'll go through the REST APIs first. And then from there, we'll go over the mobile SDK next. So to start with, let me go ahead and give you an introduction. Uh, what is CMX? So well, CMX is Connected Mobile Experience. You could almost say it's indoor navigation, but it's got a lot more to it than that. Um, we break it up into three silos. We have the detect piece. So what we can do is we can detect people on entry. And we do that various ways, mostly through Wi-Fi. But we are also adding BLEs and video as capabilities of detecting people's coming in and out. Then we have what we call the connect. This is our basically our guest access. And what's nice is it can, it's custom made if you want to do a custom portal, or it's social through Facebook. And that's actually key because we have an exclusive uh, agreement with Facebook in order to do face, uh, uh, guest access. So you can have your users basically come in and then do a check-in through Facebook. Now you get the analytics we provide. And then on top of that, you get the Facebook analytics, which includes more social information. Um, the, the, what's nice also is you can do custom splash page based on zone. So I could have a splash page here for this theater, and then I can actually create a different splash page for another zone, so it can be custom zone based. Um, we actually have some very big customers using this from the MLB on up. So the next one, and the, the one we'll go over more, is the engage. Now that we've got you on the network, basically we want to engage you. So we can do basically the blue dot experience. So I can show you where you are at, be able to give you navigation, take you to places, make you, give you context-aware information. So you can do signage, advertisement, everything around you based upon your location. Not only on your phone, but example, I'll give you examples later in the labs we do, is you can actually interact with the environment around you, because based upon the user you are. So how does it work? Basically, it does probing. This information sent to the access point, then to the controllers, and so forth down. We then can triangulate you, and then that data is sent on. So basically, the access points are detecting you, your probes as well as your data packets. So what's key about the probes is I don't have to join the Wi-Fi in order for us to detect you. In fact, in the DevNet zone, we have a screen showing exactly that kind of information where we're actually being able to see all the people around us based upon the phones doing their probing. Now, if they do actually join, they actually can use the data RSSI, which gives us even more in-depth, fast location. So how does the topology work? So we've got wireless clients, obviously, at the edge. The access points, which you'll see around here, basically on stands and various other places. The access points will then basically aggregate that information and send it on to the wireless LAN controller. That information is then basically pulled by the MSC in order to do triangulation calculation. So basically, we've created an architecture that's nice and easy and can handle a high throughput. We can track thousands of clients easily. Once that MSC gets that information, then it can be sent on to different other objects. So for example, in our case, for the mobile apps, what we've done is created a mobile app server. And I'll go into that more later, basically explaining why we separated the two there. So what's new? So basically, I wanted to go over just what was new and what we've been presenting at Cisco Live here. So we, need, we have basically fast locate, which we've already been shipping, but now we've announced the hyper locate. We're actually BLE aware as well. So we can actually locate you now within a submeter, basically. We've got simplified tools, which is our 10.0 release, which gives us a lot more capabilities as far as doing the UI and presenting that U information through analytics and as well as location. And then enter the scaling. And this is really key for the 10.0. Our scaling has gone up significantly in this release talking three times. We're adding clustering, real-time analytics. The latency improvement has gone up significantly. If you're familiar with the 8.0, you'll see a significant improvement in the latency. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Basically, before, 
we had five to seven meters. Now we're looking at a sub-meter. Before, one to two updates per minute. So basically, we would sometimes the client would have a very big lag in between. Now we're talking 10 to 120 updates per minute. And then before the latency, 10 to 20 seconds. Now we're talking two to four seconds range, basically, of the latency. What does that do? It basically enables us to basically gain more insight and improve the customer. So now that we got this information, how do we access that information programmatically? So we've got two ways of doing it. One is the REST API. So this is the way for you to do it from the server side. So you have your services, and I want to gather up this information. So what we do is we've got capabilities to get information about clients. We also have capabilities to get information about anything out there from Bluetooth sensors, wireless video, anything can be jamming, interferes. All this information can be gained through this information. And so what it is is it's basically <coughs> REST APIs to get tags. And tags are basically uh, devices out there. Interferes are considered basically out there. And then the rogue APs and clients are considered out there. So all these are categorized, and we have REST APIs to pull e information from there as well. So what are the REST APIs? They're your standard industry REST APIs. There's nothing really unique about them. We have our typical get, post, put, and delete. We URI. We do XML and JSON. Um, and there's basic authentication, which we, we use today. Uh, the output type indicates the query we return. So it's basically your basic REST APIs. Now, what, do, what are the categories? So we have four different categories of REST APIs we have today. We have real-time location, which means I can query the REST API and get the location of a specific device, or I can get all the devices and pull out that current location as of now. So that means I query and I get that data. You can also get map information. So basically what we do is we lay a map information. And that map information also includes the access points, information about how they were placed. It includes any zonage information that you've added in. So basically any, and you can actually physically download the map that we're using at that point. So at the hackathons, for example, we do a DevNet, we do a lot, they do a lot of REST APIs where they download the maps. They get the maps, and then they start layering on the various services they want to lay on top of that. Now then we have location history. So then we have real-time location, and now we can also get the historical information. And again, like on the lab, the, uh, the screen over there, you can see where you've been over time. And so we can have a historical information of where specific devices are. And then finally, the notification API. So this is a way of, instead of having to query for this information per periodically or something like that, instead I'm a receiver of this information in real time. So as a client moves, I can actually get notified of his movement, and then I can do something with it on my own. So again, authentication is your standard basic authentication. Base64, you can see in Postman, you just set the authorization, and that's how you get in. So on the MSC side, you have a user ID and password. You do a user colon, username colon password, and that gets you the authorization you need. Um, again, as far as the accept, if you don't put any in there, we do an XML by default currently in 8.0. And basically, it'll return back as you'd hear character sets already encoded. And th this is an example of a client count where I came back and I got a 2002 count. So paging and sorting is another key factor. So obviously, if you query for all the clients out there, you're going to have a massive amount of data, possibly. So for example, at Cisco Live, I think we're seeing about 8,000 plus clients. So if I wanted to get a full list, well, obviously I may not want to do it in one full sloop. So you can page through them and make repeated queries to get the next page. Now, by default, we do 5,000 per page. You can adjust that to bigger and say if you can handle that amount of memory, you can then do that higher up if you want. Sorting, now not all of them have sorting capabilities, but the ones that do, you can sort by different cat things. So like, for example, last located time, I want it descending. So those are the examples I can set in there as parameters. Now, what's nice is, is once you have your MSC, if you did a slash doc slash, 
you get all our REST API information out there. So you can actually then go through and look at the documentation that we have for each one of these APIs. Now, going through them, I'm gonna go through each one a little bit and just show you the capabilities of the APIs that we have. So for example, I mentioned the maps. So if I just did the maps, I would actually download all the map information so I can get basically building dimensions, again, zones, AP locations, and so forth. I can get a count, which gives me a count of various information. So if I know how many floors I have, things like that. Um, if I want more information pertinent to a floor, I can give it the campus, the building, and then the floor name, and then that will return that. And I can, again, go get the image. And now the image is nice is I can go get the image based upon just the campus, the building, and the floor name, and it will download that image for me. Now, if I already know the image name, which I got from the maps info, I could directly query for it as well. And then also, if you have a building image or a campus image, you can do the same there, where you just don't include the floor of the building, and it'll download that image as well. So all that can be downloaded through there. Um, now, this is an example of me downloading a map from our building, and it's a fourth floor. You can see I included the campus, the building, and the floor, and I downloaded an image. Now I can use that image however I want in my service. What's nice also, if we change that image or make adjustments, you have a REST API to pull that out without a problem. Now the map info, again, when I said there, you can get all sorts of information. I can get the dimensions. I can say what number floor is it? Is it an outdoor? Um, basically, does it have GPS markers? So we can do geolocation. So we recommend you place three G geolocation markers in the building, and now we can give you information not only on an X and Y capability, but as a, also a geolocation capability. And then you can do zones. So if you've actually defined zones for whatever reason, you can have that information returned as well. Um, Real-time location. So this is where I want to get the information about a client. So I can get a complete list of everything out there if I want. Now obviously that can be pretty big, but I can still do it. Now if instead, if I know the MAC address or the IP or the username, I can actually query based upon that. Um, so that will actually limit the list then somewhat. And then if I want to just do a count of the number of clients, which I showed in a previous example, I can do a count for it. So I can get an idea of the count. And again, the response type, this is just what I wanted to say, was you can set the accept. And if I say application slash JSON, it comes back as a JSON object. So basically your typical REST call, and I can handle the JSON object how I want. Um, Real-time location client. So this is some of the data you get back. And again, and here's GPS. So I mentioned that if you had the GPS, you would have that. I have some other statistics from when I first saw it to when I last located it. I have the map coordinates, again, in an X and Y positioning for feet. I have map info, basically letting me know basically of the map it's on and the information somewhat of the map. Um, the MAC address. And one of, some of the other things are probing. Is he probing or is he actually associated? That's important. Um, another one that I didn't mention as much is the confidence factor. So that indicates our level of confidence of where he is located. So the bigger the number, obviously the less confident we are in that location. Um, now the, for, this is for tags. And you'll notice again, it's very similar to the clients. And so I just wanted to bring that up. You can do accounts, you can get a full list, or again, you can get a specific item of a tag if you want that. Again, this is a uh, tag. Now, in this one, I wanted to sort of show more or less is the paging capabilities. So in this case, I have only one page, but if I had multiple pages, I would get that info. I'd get the current page and the page size that I've currently returned. And again, the map location, again, for here. And now what's nice with tags is I can get battery information or vendor information as well. Now rogues, and these are rogue APs. 
I can again do the same type of queries, the same type of counts, and get the same information. Row clients, not much different. Again, MAC address, same type of information. Uh, interferers, again, the same thing. Again, the counts, the interferers, and so forth. And then what, and this one I just wanted to show is, is I can, we can basically do the same thing, but now I can figure out affected channels, affected bands, and the device type if we've categorized it. So I actually can get that information. Um, other things also are zone of impact, the duty cycle, and what we can consider a severity for what this particular client's doing to us. Um, now the history <coughs> is nice because now I can go get historical information about clients. So this one again, I can get a count. I can also do a specific uh, historical over based on a specific ID, which means I can get a count of information of that. I can also get the information for the client, or I can just go and get all the client's historical information. And this is a nice, again, the pages, the page size. This is all sort of the same information you got for a real-time location, but now it's basically historical in fact. <laughs> and um, tags, again, the same thing there that we had for clients, and we're going to repeat this over again. Tags, rogue APs, rogue clients, and interferers. And then finally, we get to the notification API. So, so those were all query-based information. But say you want to be able to, instead, I don't want to query for this information. I want to see what's going on in my network in real time. And I don't, need, I don't want to query for it directly. So what we can do is we can actually send you events. So you can actually create and basically get those events. So there's, we have APIs for doing that. So we have APIs for getting a specific event name that you have already registered for. You can delete it if you want to. Or if you want to create your own programmatically, you can create your own. And what can you do there is when you create the subscription, you basically say, what's the format that you want for the notifications that are being sent to you? Where do you want it sent? On which port? And then the event type. So I'll go through the, all the different event types. So we have all these different events that you can subscribe for. Um, typical of the people that use this are movement event triggers. Those are the typical ones that they always use. And then you get a 201 if it is created successfully. You notice it was a put method. So what are the type of events you can do? Absent events. So we can do that if, a, if the device is considered absent. We have battery events. We have exciter events. We have containment events, which is another popular one when a device goes inside or outside of a zone. We can actually send you. And that, that's sort of where the zonage becomes important, at least on the MIC side. So now I can track when people are coming in and when people are leaving the zone. We got the emergency events, the map info change. Again, if you load, did something on the map side, I can be triggered to do that, maybe download a new map. Then the movement events. Now that's our most important one. And, then, and this one we also say you have to, then you need to configure the distance that you want to be notified about. So is it 10 feet that you want me to notify you? Or when the client moves 20 feet, I want to be notified of that particular event change. And that's what we do there. Again, we have a presence event, which is another nice one. Basically, that's to tell me when something is, some device is first detected. And then the streaming notifications. And this is an example of an event. It's a movement event, as you can see from here. It includes the device ID, the location map, the coordinates, GPS, and the timestamp. So all of this will be sent to that particular IP address and port we had defined earlier. And then you can parse that however you want from then on. Um, now 10.0, I wanted to go over. So that's, these are all 8.0s. And 10.0 is pretty much the same thing going forward. But there are some changes. So some of the changes, and actually the nicest change I like, is improved documentation using IO docs. Um, and what that does is it gives you the ability now in our docs to try out the APIs directly. 
So you get the links and you want to try out various parameters. We give you the ability to fill in various parameters and then try it out and see what the result. Then it'll show you the URI that it built in order to do that and then you can actually reuse that information. Now the, the other thing of note is we did change the URIs more. We wanted to make it a little bit more compact and simpler for the users to implement. Instead of having all this, basically we had before API context aware, and then you finally got to the V1. Well, we want to strip out the context aware and just focus on what, what the information you want, which is, is it location, then V1 client's history. So we did some URI changes, um, but after the net, the data can be the same in the most part. We actually have additional APIs coming forward. Now again, this is an example of it, and the format's gonna probably change before we finally release it, but the idea is, is I give it some credentials at the very top of the I.O. a docs that I want to use, and then depending upon whatever one you're using, we'll have various parameters that you can fill in, and then you hit a try it button. So in this case, I want to look for a specific client MAC address. And so what I can do then is fill in the MAC address field, then hit the try it button. What it'll do is it'll show me the URI it's built in order to make that request and tell me the response code. And then it'll also give me the header information and the body, obviously, that it comes back with. And all this can be done directly in the docs there where you get it for when you use it. And just for an example, we're already using this, these REST APIs in the DevNet zone. So what they've done is in this particular example, they've actually built heat maps type of thing where they can see various users and correlate that information into types of zones. They're also tracking into specific users around here and they'll show you that as well. This is all done through REST APIs. So <coughs> these pages are actually their pages. Not, these are not MSE serve pages, so they've actually created it and they've built on top of our services. And I'll go through even more use cases, basically, of the services that you can augment on top of this. So now the SDK. So this is the mobile side, basically. So that was more of a services side to see everything around me. Now the SDK is, again, part of the engage strategy. We want to engage the user. But what we wanted to do is create a find me capability. So the problem with the current REST APIs is, is it doesn't work for a find me very well. It's, it gives you access to the MSC, and you don't want to expose all that data that the, to the end user as far as security and so forth. So what we did is we created an SDK that will run on iOS and Android that gives you that find me capability. And we actually added additional features that you can leverage as well. And so what's different in this case with the SDK, what we did, we've done is created a mobile app server. And again, this we created separate from the MSC because what we had here is we have devices that need to query for their location based upon Wi-Fi. Well, the MSC has that information and we need to get it to the device somehow. Well, we didn't want them going directly talking to an infrastructure device. A, you don't, maybe these, this is in a DMZ and I want my app to reside out in the public and so forth. So what we did is we created a mobile app server, and its job is to be able to host, to be able to handle that particular client and respond to information it wants. And it has no callback capabilities. It's just strictly a push type of model. So that's nice because it doesn't, you don't have any firewall issues. He can reside outside the DMZ if you want. He can, he can reside in the DMZ if you want also. It doesn't really matter. But what's nice is, is this device then talks to him and he can then pull down his location. And as we go forward, it will show you he can do more than that. He can pull down maps, points of interest, zone information such as banners and things like that. But we've also added in the ability to do push notifications. So when you, when you first enter a venue, you can have a mobile push notification saying, welcome to the venue and, and basically please launch my app. But in, dis in addition to just doing a straight push notification, we've embedded information about which Wi-Fi they should join. So we, you have a preferred network, and we say, oh, this is the Wi-Fi you want the vet people to join. If you're at, at, anywhere around us, you'll notice that this list of Wi-Fi is pretty long. 
So getting the customer comfortable on which one to join is nice through the push. Now for Android, we can actually put them on the Wi-Fi if you want. We can prompt them if need be and say, here, we want you to join and we can do it for you. Or in the case of iOS, we can at least show them how to join and take them to the settings and say, join this Wi-Fi. So it gives them a little bit more confidence that when they're joining the Wi-Fi, they're joining the vendor's Wi-Fi that they want to be on. Now, how does CMX work? Again, it's the same model as before, where basically everything is. But the little difference here is, is the SDK is pulling this information from here. So what's the experience for a particular person? So user still now needs to download the mobile app. So we cannot do push notifications without an app on the phone. We often get the question of, can I send a push notification just because he entered the venue? No, not without an app. So first, they need to get the app. The user installs, accepts terms and conditions. And what we do is we call it a registration step with our server. We need to do that because we want to secure up that particular device such that when he quest requests his information for location, he only gets his information. He cannot go out and query for anybody else. We built in basically a, a password security model such that he will only be the device to query for it. Once he registers and installs it, we've built that up. The user can then enter the venue. The MSC will capture this information determine basically where he's at, notify the mobile app server. The mobile app server will look up this information and say, oh, is he coming in? Is he a registered user? And the app server can then do a push notification if you want, which allows the ability to launch that app. And then basically the user accepts the notification, and then he can be onboarded through the app. So it's a way to try and get the user to onboard and use the app. So what are the components that make up the CMX mobile SDK? So I, like I said, we've shown you sort of the mobile app server, which is that piece there that basically runs on it. The SDK, which basically runs on Android and iOS. And what's key about it is it gives you an X and a Y, a Latin launch if you have that. We do have some mapping capabilities if you want those. So those can be used, or you can just use the X and the Y, which is their core library. Now, the other piece we do is we have a simulator. So obviously, testing it out, you really may not have the Cisco infrastructure as a mobile app developer. So what we do is we provide them a simulator today that they can download. Then they can have the same infrastructure on their device without it going anywhere. So I can simulate the venue and so forth. And I'll show you pictures of that. Now, what is the mobile app server made up of? It's a Linux RPM. So it's pretty, it's very lightweight. It can, its job is to receive location updates and configuration information. It'll actually contain more going forward. It processes the mobile clients and map information. On a small dual core eight gig RAM system, it can handle 5,000 active app users at once. So that means 5,000 people with their apps open, all of them running it various ways, trying to get location and all that. So on a small system like that, we can actually be that good at handling it. Um, setup is really straightforward. You give it a username and password. Then on the MSC side, you simply add that in with two sync from then on, basically. Um, we've built in diagnostic commands and other commands to make it simple for you to troubleshoot just in case. Um, we haven't built a UI on it at this point because, again, we wanted to keep it very lightweight at this point. Um, installation is your typical RPM command, which is an IVF, and you can install it. We do support upgrades. We can upgrade to the newer version, and then you can actually run a, a QI to determine the current version through the RPM command. We have a, obviously a, a command shell as well that'll give you that information as well. Setup is just running an S setup shell script and you just need to set the username password through there and you're good to go. Uh, so connect and engage. So again, this sort of goes through all the feature sets that we can do through the SDK. Now, ones I didn't go over as much is the routing capability. So we do have routing. If you add the routes in, we can navigate the user to a specific point. 
points of interest can be added. You can actually have your own points of interest icons, give them specific names. And then the nice thing is we can also do bannering per zone. So as I go in a particular zone, you can have the banner information changed upon that zone. And again, if you want that. So the way the SDK works is there's a core piece, which is just the X, Y, and zone information. And then you can handle the maps yourself. So we work with different vendors, for example, that already have very good mapping infrastructures and so forth. They can do that, and we just provide the location for them. Now, for people that don't have the capabilities to do the mapping, we give them through the SDK that capability. Um, so this is 8.0. I don't have the 10.0 screenshots yet. But basically, this is the map. You can, again, add your own maps in there. Now, we can create zones. Now, these zones are a little bit different because they don't have to be the same zones that MSC has, per se, by default. These are more maybe mobile zones, so more specific to the mobile device. Reason being is maybe I want to do push notifications in these zones, or I want to do bannering versus actual location zone. So again, you can enter a push notification message. You just type the message in. That message will appear basically in that zone. And again, on this thing, we have a cloud sync status. So when you add them in, you can sync, check and you can sync it forcefully. It will sync automatically, but this is just more of a way to be more confident. <coughs> this one is um, uh, basically, sorry, routes and points of interest. This is an older, old looking field, but what it, we can do is you define the routes you would like a user to walk. So it's similar to Google when it's defining the roads. It basically, the idea is, is when, where can I move within a venue? So obviously, you don't want them walking through walls or other obstacles. So you define those routes. The points of interest can be anything you want. Um, there's a different page we have for defining that. The, the reason being is, is I can say, hey, this particular cafe can be reused and reused throughout the building, use the same icon, the same name, et cetera. So those can be all added to the maps. It's really easy to do. As far as banners, so we have a concept of bannering as well. Like I said before, we can see a banner if you use our map view. You just simply add in the banners. Today, it's basically just an image. Going forward, we're working with different technologies such as video and audio. And what we do is we tie it to a campaign. And a campaign in this sense is I have a list of banners. When to display those banners? In which zone should I be showing these banners in? So you define the zonage, basically, and then the banners that you want to be able to show while in that zone. Push notification configuration. So if you're familiar with Apple and Android, Apple requires a push notification file and a password for that file. You upload that for your app. Uh, for Android, it's just a key. You just type in the key, and you can set that. Now, that gives us the capability then to do the push notifications to your app whenever you define that you want us to do that. Now, again, the SDK. These are the basically all on DevNet today. And what we do is we've broken up into five different pieces. We have an Android SDK, which is our SDK you can use. We give you sample apps. So we have a several different sample apps to try out if you want to try them out. Same with iOS, it's SDK, and a sample app, and then the mobile app simulator. So we allow you to run the simulator right now locally. In the future, we'll just host it in the cloud for you probably. But for now, you can actually run it from anywhere from a Mac, Windows, to Linux, et cetera. It can run on it. It's very lightweight. Um, it's a Node.js, basically, device, uh, package. And again, going through the capabilities, the X, the Y, the admin interface is where you can basically define your routes. That all gets synced to the mobile app server. Everything you did on that MSC gets pushed out. Basically, we have a map view with the points of interest. So you'll see those points that you defined appear on your map. You can do wayfinding, push notification. You can be asked to join the Wi-Fi. And then what we have is a workaround for iOS 7 MAC address issue. So I didn't go through it too much, but basically there's, there, the iOS has the ability to scramble the MAC address. We've actually got a workaround for that since the developers can't get to the MAC address also programmatically. 
we can determine it through basically the pairing of the Wi-Fi. <coughs> um, SDK development. So again, the development is done basically using the sample apps. If you have your own existing app, we're simply you can be added in through there no, with no problem. We do provide the simulator, which is key. Again, you don't have the infrastructure and you don't want to test it out. How do I test it out? Well, you have a simulator. As far as the SDK is concerned, there is no difference between a simulator and the real world. It doesn't know that it actually is talking to a simulator. So when you're testing this, you can be confident that that same code will work in the real setup you have. Now, in the simulator, we have two ways of using it. So by default, it sort of shows a dot moving around on the map. And what it does is basically it simulates a user walking a certain path. So that's one mode. So you can see it constantly moving. And you'll see zone changes and the maps changing. And all that can be done through the simulator. We also have the ability to, to programmatically change it yourself. So instead of walking the set path, I want to control the path myself. So you can do that as well. Um, testing can be done on a virtual. So if you're using your own sim, uh, basically Android or Xcode, you can do it through there. So you don't need or no, need a mobile device specifically to do that. And the routes and points are limited on the simulator. So that's one of the things we're looking at improving going forward is we do have a set set of maps. We do have a set set of point of interest. All that's set there. Um, but you don't have any way to adjust it for your own maps just to try them out. So we're going to add that capability going forward. Again, Android and iOS, um, 6.0 and higher, 2.3 and higher here. Uh, you can download it. It's on DevNet. It's freely downloadable. Um, the only thing here is we require permissions. We have a manifest file. And then basically, we've shown that in the examples too. Um, this is an example of the simulator. Now, it doesn't have this line, but we put the line in just to show you that this is the route that particular user would walk. So basically, it tells you sort of moves little by little along the path. And that's what basically a default route it'll walk. So that way, when you're testing your app, you can see basically, OK, I'm confident I'm seeing it moving along this path. Documentation's all there. We also have a web interface. So again, on the web interface, I can instead just click on the map, and the dot will move for me. You'll see that same movement occur on the sample app you're using. So you can actually try it out exactly the same. Now, Android SDK. So yes, we can do Android Studio, where basically you can import it. We give, in this example, we have a sample UI. You can basically load it up and start using it. You do need to set some permissions. So obviously, we want access to the Wi-Fi, especially if you want to do that onboarding of the user such that they try and join the Wi-Fi automatically. Um, we can set, we need that set as well. Now, the code, this is just a simple example of the code. We require an initialization of the code that just initializes it for that particular app. Then what we need is we have to have the set the configuration. Now, the configuration basically is tell me which mobile app server I need to talk to. What's the location of that mobile app server, in essence? And then once you've done that, you can then start the polling right, out, right away. And so on every update, I can get the location from there. I can get the map coordinates. Or if I have longitude and latitude, I didn't have it there, but you can see it. And then the nice thing is you can get the zone name as well. Now, that's nice because if I do set out my zones and I want to take actions on the app, then I can do that. Now, that becomes important because I can create inclusion zones, exclusion zones, and say I want to do things for there. There's a way to launch the map view. It's real simple. Again, you can just launch it straight away from the CMX client. Pretty much everything is done through the singleton class CMX client, and then you just do a get instance on it, and then you're allowed to go and do whatever you want from there. We have Java docs on all of this. We have nice, clean documentation on DevNet. And this is an example of me running it in a virtual device. Now, this is a sample app just to show you that some of the information you can retrieve using the SDK. 
and there's a map button. If I click on there, it would take me to a map view. Push notifications, you can receive them. It shows up on your device like anything else. And this is an example of the map view we provide. So in this map view, I've got some points of interest I've thrown in quickly. I've got a slider for different floors, so we support multiple venues, multiple floors, no problem. We have a search capability. When you did us do a search, we'll find that particular uh, point of interest on the map and indicate that to you. And again, we have a bannering capability as well. All that comes in the SDK, and you can use it at your will if you want, however you want. Um, this is an example of the navigation. It's a little funky, but that's sort of how, the, because of the way they laid out this particular, uh, they drew the lines here, so it'll basically show you that route there. And in this case, I'm navigating to a place called Miami Beach. Uh, the slide out menu, you can have icons on their various levels. You can select the floors. If I want my current location, we have a button at the top to do that. We also have a settings buttons for our other items are there. Again, the search capability. In this case, I search for Santa. I got Santa Cruz. I can do a navigation straight away from there. I can actually click on it and get inf uh, information about, about that point of interest as well. And again, the sample app again. This shows an example of me getting the map, the geolocation, the zone, information about the MAC address, so forth. <coughs> All this can be programmatically done, and there. And then we have the iOS SDK. So again, it's a framework in the iOS. You basically pull it in, and you can use it right away. And again, this one's, again, real simple to use. Again, CMX client instance. Start your polling with the interval you want to start polling. And from there, you can pull in the map coordinate information. So really the sa same as basically the Android. And we have actually supporting with. And again, the map view, I just wanted to show you. Similar map view. <clears throat> in this case, I do not have a banner because we didn't want to use banners for this particular use case. So I have basically a sliding menu and a search capability is no different than the Android platform. So use cases. So why don't I just show you the use cases. These are actually use cases for the M at mobile SDK and the REST APIs we have today. We've actually built up a lab, and we've tried, we broke it up into four verticals here. We've got banking, hospitality, retail, and healthcare. And from these four verticals, we built up different use cases for each one. So in banking, for example, we actually do is we can do signage change around us. So basically when a user walks in with his device, we actually can show the different signage changing in this particular vertical. And that signage can be also be specific to the user because now when we knock in, we know that device. We know we can basically through some back end, we can tie that device to a user. If it's a VIP person, we can have the signage indicate that. We have on the desk, for example, signage for each from a home loan to a checking account. And depending upon what he's coming in for, we actually can change that signage for that particular desk and tell them that particular user has arrived. And then you can actually interact with that user immediately. You can actually have the banking information tied all in there. And that's what we do. So that's one example of us using location, and now the location isn't just the location on the device, it's actually interacting with the environment around us. <clears throat> Hospitality. So again, in here we can actually do push notifications. So as he walks in, we can say a welcome message, but we also can do signage also. We actually do it in a different way here. What we do here is we can actually show him his favorite menu. So we actually can pull up basically what he's ordered in the past and say, hey, it seems like you like this particular drink. Do you wish to order it again? <clears throat> and 
We can also, we also use in this particular area with BLE and video analytics. So we can actually place BLE devices, interact with those BLEs knowing he's walked up to them, and basically we can actually then pull off the analytics from that. So when I walk up to a BLE, I'll know he's walked up to that BLE, I know he's there. That information is sent to our server, and then it can be used later for analytics. So we also have video analytics. So we have cameras basically near the door entrances where I can see people walking in and exiting. So what I can do is I can create a flow pattern of who's coming in, how many people, and who's leaving, how many people. We have two types of cameras we're trying to play with. One's a video, basically an actual video camera that you would normally have for security. Another one is an infrared camera also that we use. So again, that gives you a way to also to create a pattern flow. So all that gets mulched into the CMX, and we can combine and fuse this data together to give you ideas of analytics information around you. So basically, again, we can create a better guest experience and an integrated analytics that allows you to figure out your environment better. Retail. Retail is one of the ones we've been doing a lot. Um, we have lots of use cases we're going forward with. Um, we have such things as you can walk up to specific merchandise and put your phone next to it. You get an option to add it to your cart or to your wish list. So basically, just by your proximity to the beacon, you can actually do that. So we can have several beacons around and interact with them. Um, we can also do is, this is the key for analytics, is is there too many patrons in, the, in a particular area and I don't have good coverage? So I can determine that. I can see there's a lot of people and I have one employee there. So basically, they can be notified to actually bring more employees out to assist. So that's a key feature there, because now I can do is I'm identifying the device the employee's carrying versus the normal patrons, and I can see where my employees are moving around, and then I can actually then have them called and brought into the areas as needed. We also have the ability to do self-checkout in a sense. So one of the things we did is you put all this stuff in your cart, you walk up to the cash register, boom, that cart information's exchanged right there, you click buy and boom, the customer can then wait and his merchandise can be pulled from the back. So the merchandise isn't really kept there, it's more visual. The real merchandise is kept in the back somewhere. He's then notified once the merchandise is completed and ready, he then gets another notification saying ready to pick it up. So basically what we're doing again is customer experience and what we can do because they're doing the apps, we actually have an inventory management capability there too. Then the last one is healthcare. Now again, this one we interact with the environment a lot different ways. So with this one, we actually use Cisco's light of service capabilities. When I walk in, first, basically if the patient's there, he can have nice blue mood lighting, nice and comfortable. Doctor walks in, first thing it does is the lighting's adjust and they're a lot brighter. So it's a way of controlling the environment around me. Again, knowing who the people are, I can interact with the environment. Patient charts will pop up, so I can actually see their medical records. Knowing that that doctor's walking into that room, I can be confident that they, he's there. One of the other things we're doing is we've created a sand, sand sanitizer, excuse me. So basically what, what doctors are supposed to do is wash their hands, get it all nice and clean before approaching the patient. What we've done is we built in something such if he walks to the patient first, he gets notified, look, you didn't wash your hands. Need to go do that. So we have a hand sanitizer, clicks it, washes his hands. Once he's washed it sufficient amount of time, or a certain period of time we've defined, then can he go approach the patient. So when he's over here, he'll get notified, he's washed his hands long enough. Now if he goes to the patient, he's fine, he'll get a nice good, you're okay. So again, again, working with the environment around us, we can actually interact with it. So again, patient experience, and then the compliance factor in this sense, because he, we need to make sure they wash their hands. So those are all the use cases and everything, and the SDK we have basically. So we have, again, the mobile side, and as well as the server side capabilities. All right, thank you very much.